Boa tarde, uh, good afternoon, so I will speak in English. Uh, so today I uh, welcome you here, um, Roberto Sérgio Sociais, Professor in the Dins. Uh, thank you for coming all the way. Uh, thank you for having me here. So, uh, Professor Enrico Vince is from Blavish Boyori, mm -hmm. I hope I pronounce well, University in Cluj Napoca, Romania. Uh, and she will uh, be present at the event today, the lecture, and tomorrow is another workshop at 10 o'clock, which will also take place in this room. Uh, so, the, the College of Global Studies, I will just speak a little bit about the objective. Uh, this uh, uh, the College of Global Studies. Uh, so it's a forum that aims to critically debate the processes of globalization, identifying the, the problems of the contemporary world as a starting point. Uh, the college privileges historical and inter interdisciplinary perspectives, highlighting the crucial importance of the knowledge contribution by the social sciences and humanities and the arts. So among its goals, uh, the College of Global Studies intends to stimulate the scientific discussion and critical thinking at SESH, uh, the University of Coimbra, and the wider scientific community in Portugal and, and broader audiences. Um, also, we endeavor to promote international collaboration uh, in articulation with research communities in the global south. Uh, and so we hope this is the starting point for collaboration also with the University of Professor Eniko and other Eastern European universities, as we were speaking, that uh, have in the past, uh, we have had people from, uh, from uh, Romania, but we wish to foster this collaboration. So this is the first of two moments in 2022, uh, where the College of Global Studies uh, will bring uh, researchers to reflect together on the topic that is developed by an invited speaker. So this is the first moment of the 2022 edition. And, and so today we have the lecture by Professor Eniko Vinsu on racialized capitalism and intersectional injustice in times of war, uh, view from the European Scenic Periphery. Uh, and tomorrow we will have a workshop, uh, as I said, uh, which will be on the topic, what are the prospects for intersectional justice in the neoliberal Europe? Uh, and we have talks by uh, Ana Cordero Santos, Lucia Marta Araújo and Sara Araújo, who we thank uh, very much for uh, engaging in the discussion with Professor Enrico. And we are sure that uh, it will be a very productive discussion because there are so many parallels uh, that we can think of in this in your topic. Uh, so uh, I welcome you all and we'll pass the word to Irina who will present. Yeah, I'm super emotional, okay? So um, <laughs> if Marisa is emotional, I'm like all oh, exploding right now. So I'm going to speak uh, just to be transparent about it. Uh, I've been thinking the whole day, how am I going to present Enigo? <laughs> and I still don't know exactly, but I will tell you how I feel about Enigo because I didn't know her personally. I, I just met her last night <laughs> and we hugged and, you know, but I knew her on Facebook for the last 10 years because she's, she says one of the few, but I would say like the only one because he's the only one I know in Romania who does not just work on Romani uh, segregation and on social housing and on war, and on racialized capitalism, and on environmental racism. I don't know anybody doing these kind of connections in Romania. She thinks there are others, but I don't know. Uh, and definitely she's one of the most, let's say, known public intellectuals who have been working on this. And she became more, in, let's say, known, not only because of the things that she writes, because less people have time to read, but, <laughs> because of the fact that she has been very much involved in mobilizing people for social housing and for Roma community. So this is something unusual, uh, not only for, for activism in Romania, there are not too many people who are actually doing activism in Romania on this topic. Thank you for coming. But also uh, in, in connecting these issues and doing protests and doing all kinds of actions, street actions, and bringing people together from different movements and showing the connections about that's why I thought one word 
that is fashionable nowadays, but I didn't use it because it's fashionable. I, I use it because I really felt like the way she connects different causes and different movements can only be described with these words. I don't know a better word, maybe we can think together, together of a better word for this, but it sounded like the right, the right word at this moment. So now I can also read the more official presentation of Enrico, which I don't like, but uh, I don't like to read. But uh, you probably already read that uh, Enrico is a professor at the University in Cluj, the only you know, very famous professor, uh, university in Cluj. Um, and she has been doing the activist job and uh, with the, the so-called local group Social Housing Now in Romania is Kush Sociale Acum uh, with different ethnic groups because especially in this part of Romania you have a lot of uh, uh, Hungarian uh, 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 groups, a lot of Romanians and the Roma communities so it's even more let's say uh, interesting from this point of view, uh, and the, she has been doing this for a long time, uh, at least 10 years that I know, but may, I may be wrong, <laughs> I'm not sure, and very interesting, she has been, let's say, conceptualizing these issues by using uh, a word that is rarely used in Romania, and probably also here, which is uh, segregation and um, ghettoization, no? At least I don't know too many people who write uh, using these conceptual lenses, which is also, you know, more like coming from critical thinking in the U.S. And she is a co-editor of important volumes that I would say, uh, again, that are very uh, unique for Romania also. Uh, one is on the Romani women movement in Central and Eastern Europe, and the other one is uh, spaces of marginality at the periphery of global capitalism. <coughs> So I guess that's for me very important and I try to <laughs> do the right presentation as much as I could. Thank you again for coming. Thank you so much for these um, introductions and uh, thank you again for, for having me here. It's, um, uh, it's really, if you are emotional, I don't know how I am, um, to, to connect to your scientific and also public uh, uh, like traditions here at the, at the center, so your critical analysis, and I, I'm sure that um, uh, we can nicely connect. And thank you for uh, um, ha having you here for, for tomorrow's workshop. Uh, it's really a, a very unusual format for me, so um, it's um, hope that it will be a good experience for everybody. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I prepared the PowerPoint presentation because uh, I was thinking to um, also to share with you some pictures uh, which visually introduce us uh, in the, in the um, spaces, so to speak, or to have a, a special sense of, uh, of discussion about housing inequalities and human needs and uneven development in cities. Uh, and I also will share at the, at the, at the point um, a, short, uh, a short video and um, um, that's going to happen quite soon. Um, yeah, the, 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 the title, well, somehow uh, together with Irina, we, we gave birth to this uh, complicated title which is so many <laughs> concepts. Uh, so uh, I, I, just to try to make some order um, in this um, conceptual field, uh, I would say that um, the issue I'm addressing is that of um, housing injustice, um, but uh, it's, uh, I'm addressing it as a manifestation of, of a larger phenomenon of what I call intersectional injustice on which we can find uh, different power systems uh, uh, working together in, in creating um, housing unevenness and injustice. Um, okay, so where is this located, my talk in Romania? So uh, I'm, I'm really, it's, it's good to know that you, you had uh, researchers and PhD students from Romania here. Um, and also, yeah, I guess we can uh, connect uh, as, a, as a background through the fact that um, in a way, both Portugal and Romania is a semi-periphery of, of global capitalism and also of the European Union. 
So I'm sure that there are many um, processes that um, um, uh, we can analyze together. Uh, and uh, yeah, for me, in, uh, in, in um, you know conceptualizing this, this this matter of racialized capitalism, uh, I, I found uh, very very inspirational thoughts in Nancy Fraser's and uh, Lisa Love's um, work who actually, uh, both of them are uh, stressing how, how capitalism and, and, and racism are uh, uh, acting together and, and how racial capitalism is something that is capitalism in itself, which needs uh, the, the creation of, of racial hierarchies and, and uh, also as a just, racism as a justification for the existence of uh, inequalities, unevenness, and injustices across the world. Um, so it's um, also uh, Nancy Fraser's uh, insights into um, racialized labor and, and, and how she, she conceptualizes this as a, um, as a matter of how capitalism needs both the uh, exploitation of wage labor and also the expropriation of, uh, of um, informal racialized labor, so all sorts of, of, of labor that, well, maybe as a, as a Marxist term, we can also use for that uh, the term of surplus population, right? The creation of a reserve army of labor, which is very part of how capitalism functions. So, um, yeah, it's this, and, and, and I'm trying to connect this to, to the issue of housing. So how um, um, racialization of, of uh, housing uh, matters, and then even this also happens. But actually, this is what I'm going to present uh, further. Um, yeah, the, the one question, uh, times of war, um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, not going to to enter into very detailed discussions about that because yeah that would need another topic and another days other days to to discuss about but yeah only yeah some 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 thoughts about what uh, what actually means times of war or when is the times of war because uh, as we can um, um, figure out nowadays too in in, in Europe we we, we liked um, supposing that there were no wars in, uh, in Europe since the Second World War. And uh, as Europeans, uh, well, sometimes we did not uh, notice that uh, how, how many war, wars were going on in the world uh, because they were far or they did not affect us directly. But now with the war in Ukraine, things changed because uh, of the proximity uh, of, of this conflict and uh, uh, now uh, for a sudden uh, well, uh, we, can, uh, we can feel uh, um, also the political pressure and economic pressure to uh, um, consider um, how actually the world order is remade in, in in our lives, so something that we maybe we were not expecting to happen in our lifetime, uh, but uh, yeah, we see it happening, and we see how the war is an instrument for uh, this remaking of uh, of global capitalism and, uh, and as the global order as we knew it at least in the past 30 years. So. Um, uh, our comrades in the, in the movement are uh, um, living in an uh, area in Cluj, Napoca, which is called Patarut. Uh, so uh, I, I, I'm thinking to uh, make first an introduction and to zoom in into a little bit into that territory and then zoom out towards larger um, uh, processes and uh, understandings of, of uh, uh, of housing uh, unevenness during uh, advanced capitalism and racialized capitalism. So, uh, yeah, I propose to, to understand um, this area as a space of intersectional injustice uh, because this is a case where people, and it's about um, 
1,500 persons who are um, living in deprived and marginal um, housing in a toxic environment. So here we have the case of, of housing deprivation uh, intersected with uh, environmental uh, injustice. So it's uh, it's uh, which actually also a case of environmental racism, which not only, so to speak, pushes uh, low-income people to the margins and segregated areas, but actually puts their uh, life and health uh, under risk day by day because they, uh, they, their, their homes are nearby the city's landfill. Uh, okay, and I, <clears throat> this is the the map of the city is just for the sake of you know visualizing uh, where is our area that I'm talking about, which has actually um, four uh, different uh, um, territories which differ in their histories and, and their uh, current uh, uh, situation. So yeah, the distance from the city and the fact that uh, they are nearby the landfill makes this um, situation uh, uh, specific and uh, yeah, the, like I, I I I may say that hundred percent of, of people are are, are, are Roma. How uh, much is the di the distance? I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, well, it's like uh, eight kilometers, uh, and they don't have uh, um, like eight kilometers to the center, so to speak. Uh, and um, there is no public transport here, so they, they even have to walk through the, uh, like, four kilometers to the, to the stop of uh, Afro public transport. Um, okay, so uh, some, some Google map um, images. Um, you can see here uh, <coughs> this uh, small uh, barracks which actually form the uh, the oldest uh, <coughs> area from Patarut, which is called Dallas. Um, and um, hmm, yeah, in, the, in relation with this area, in a way, the local public authorities may say that they are not responsible of, uh, of this housing situation because people came uh, on their own will. Uh, they came uh, quite a uh, long time ago, starting with the 1970s. So th this area uh, also has a, a, a socialist history, if you wish. Uh, but they were the only community by then. And they came from villages and didn't get jobs at the factories, so they started to work on the, on the landfill, selecting the, the garbage. Um, so there is a, a, a totally informal uh, settlement, um, and, and um, I'm, I'm sure that um, you know the, the usual characteristics, so it's not just unsecured because it's informal, it's not just that it's very close to the landfill, but it's also uh, lacking utilities in the house, and uh, um, yeah, so, um, okay. Um, and, and still they are there and still the landfill um, uh, functions. I'm going to say something about the landfill as well. Hmm. Okay, um, yeah, this is a closer and uh, newer, red newer picture from 2012, so you can see. Actually the, the colony developed a bit and uh, some, the condition of some houses and, and barracks improved due to a uh, Dutch uh, humanitarian uh, organization which helps people to to do these improvements. Okay, then we have uh, um, the, uh, historically speaking the second uh, uh, territory in Patarut, which is Canton Rui Street, uh, a little bit more further from the from the landfill. Um, and in, in the case of, of, of this um, Area, the, the local authorities actually had um, at least an indirect uh, uh, responsibility. I mean, this area was from starting with 2000, so it's a later development uh, <coughs> part of the changes of the city uh, after 1990, uh, which included, among others, evictions uh, from. Uh, other spaces of, of the city which underwent gentrification and, and 
uh, well, as he, it usually happens, the land um, gained uh, a higher uh, exchange value, so people uh, who used to live there um, were, uh, were evicted from, from, from the homes and they were occupied formerly, or they were staying there as, uh, you know, because they were buildings which belonged to the so-called old state owned housing fund of the, of the city. So the, as a result of the evictions happening in the 1990s, um, yeah, the city was directed people here on, on the street, somehow promising them that this is going to be a temporary solution, which became quite permanent. So permanentization of temporality is, is very much part of this, of this story. Uh, and the, the area increased because in 20 years, as it happens, uh, new generations were born who couldn't move out anywhere else, so they built a barrack, the side of the barracks of their, their parents. And, and here too we have some humanitarian organizations which um, uh, some put some uh, um, housing units there with the approval of the city hall. So therefore I'm saying that there is a, a shared responsibility in that. Uh, and yeah, and here uh, a, a picture uh, 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 from within this, this community. So okay, just to get a sense where we are. Uh, good. And now, uh, yeah, so this is a, a picture made from by uh, with a drone, actually it, we had an event, I don't know, in 2013 or so. Um, the, these are, uh, these uh, houses that you see here, are the newest colony in, in, in Patarut, uh, which was uh, created by the city hall. So in this case, the authorities and the state, you may say, has a direct uh, uh, responsibility in, um, uh, in and how. So they, they uh, transformed this area, from, which is an industrial area due to the uh, proximity of the landfill. So they transformed this area into a residential area and they built these uh, so-called modular houses there. So it's, um, um, yeah, at least they have uh, uh, cold water inside and electricity. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the whole surroundings and, and the toxicity of the of the of the environment due to the to the, the landfill uh, uh, makes the life of, of people terrible. Um, okay, and who were moved here? Uh, they were like um, seventy six families uh, who were evicted in 20, 2010 from a more central part of the, of the cities. I'm not entering into details, but uh, yeah, that was somehow the city hall's plan to get rid of them from there because the, the territory uh, became important and some new real estate developments uh, uh, needed them to, 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 to leave from there. And uh, yeah, as the city hall said, they found no other solution just to move them near the near the landfill. And, and here a picture uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from in inside of, of this area. Okay, and now, uh, so I'm not going to show this uh, uh, video, but yeah, maybe if you would be interested to see it later, it's available also on YouTube. At the point we made um, um, a fundraising campaign because we sued the local authorities. So we sometimes we also make things like this in, as as part of our activism uh, to appeal to justice. Uh, yeah, but the 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 case runs since three years and we are still nowhere, unfortunately. Uh, and we needed to pay for some expertise uh, for for, for uh, you know in order to prove that the. The, the garbage is toxic for people, so a thing that everybody knows, but yeah, it needs all kinds of scientific proofs for that. Okay, so uh, here are some uh, views about the landfill itself. So we had an old, old, old landfill from the 1960s. 
um, which uh, was toxic and not non-ecological, obviously. Um, and uh, what you see here, there are some barracks because some people who came from other um, counties uh, of, of Romania, so nearby countries, the counties um, um, around Cluj, uh, moved there um, uh, periodically and, and, and came from, from villages where they had a home but did not have any resources for living. So they, they, they came and were allowed to settle because of, uh, their labor force was needed and actually so they are, these are the people who assured the, the selection of garbage for decades uh, for, for people of, of, of Cruz. So this, uh, this landfill closed in 2015 due to many pressures coming from the, um, the European Union. Uh, uh, but what happened? There was no other solution, as the authorities said, ju just that to open two other new landfills, which they could temporarily. So temporarily again became kind of permanent thing, I guess, with these landfills as well. So they are just images, so just to get a sense how they look like, uh, the one and the second. And uh, the um, and because um, labor is is still needed on these new on these new landfills. What changed that now they have labor contracts, but they are paid like for uh, minimum income, and uh, and there is no protection for uh, you know for the toxicity of the of the of the conditions. Okay, um, this is a, a strange thing to figure uh, out or a prospect for future. Uh, I, again, I'm not entering into details, but seemingly there is a very ambitious real estate development plan in the area, which is quite close, uh, near to the to still running uh, temporary landfills, but maybe in the hope that they will be closed and ecologized. So they, they, there is a, they, there are some uh, uh, investors who, who started, and they even started the construction work. So, and, and there is this, you know, this, this image, so this is some, a part of what they would like to, to build there. So it's like, you know, on a hill, this is going, it's called Transylvania Smart City, so this new real estate development, and it's like in the other hill, like, like 800 meters distance, is the modular houses uh, that, um, that these ones actually. Okay, so yeah, a strange but challenging thing, you know, to, to people who were forced to live in toxic environment for decades, uh, now might be under the risk to, you know, to be um, moved out from there if the environment got, will be cleaned and ecologized and yeah, these new developments will appear in the area. Okay, um, yeah, something about this maybe in, in the um, hope that you will be interested to follow a little bit about uh, what we do um, in April is the occasion of International Roma Day. Um, we made an exhibition um, together with people from, from Patarut, uh, exhibition of photos, images, uh, <coughs> but, but also documents. Um, yeah, because what, what our movement does in relation with this situation is that we, we documented uh, as much as we could the formation of the area and people's health situation and, and um, so on and so forth. So to, to, to make things visible and to make it more political, so to, to get, yeah, to make, to put pressures on the local authorities to uh, take accountability around this. So we made this exhibition and we are yeah, planning to, to publish it in Romanian and in English as well, a brochure of that. Okay, so now the do, zooming out part in, in two steps. One step would be uh, to, to put a little bit this, this case of housing injustice in a, in a larger frame of Cluj, respectively in Romania, and to, yeah, to address housing from a political economy perspective. So um, 
Yeah, these things I already said, so how, how housing injustice in, in this case is manifested. Um, the, the many, many, and, and, and the recurrent um, cases of forced evictions as a manifestation of housing injustice, housing in a toxic environment which endangers people's life, um, living in deprived residential areas, uh, and, and being um, subjected to this process of ghettoization, which means both the, the territorial separation from the rest of the city, physically, geographically, symbolically, but this also means the, the process of racialization, like, which, which uh, refers at the same time to, to the area being the landfill, it's an inferior, it's a, uh, uh, something bad, something uh, uh, that you don't want to know about, right? Uh, but, but also the people who inherit it. So the rationalization of space uh, overlaps with rationalization of, of, uh, uh, of people who are living in that space and who are working in that space. So the racialization of, of, of their labor also, also happens in, it, in this case. And of poverty, you know, I'm sure that also you have in, in Portugal these processes by which you know, the poor are blamed for being poor and they are considered unworthy and they are considered uh, as, as, as in inferior species uh, who are uh, not able to, to cope with, uh, uh, with, with uh, uh, nowadays uh, societal challenges. And last but not least, Roma ethnicity, generally speaking, is racialized. So, and, and there is this um, generalization about, you know, you are Roma, then you are supposed to, um, to like living there or in such conditions as, as we also put in, in, in our media. So it's your choice, it must be your culture, it must be your nature to, to make a living life like that. Okay, so how is this uh, case linked to larger phenomena, um, housing related phenomena in, in, a, in a city? Um, we have everything um, that uh, any, any uh, major cities in contemporary capitalism do to display in terms of housing, so the, the rising prices of, uh, on, on the residential market, uh, which makes that uh, not only for the very poor, but for more and more categories of people, uh, housing becomes financially unaffordable. Um, and uh, uh, putting it in terms of, uh, of, of housing as a space for social uh, for, for reproduction of labor force yeah, we may say that uh, yeah, wages uh, are not uh, are not enough uh, to uh, for, for uh, several labor classes to reproduce their labor force so therefore they are kind of enforced to uh, to live on in, in such conditions like this is the same condition that we see in Patalud, but also uh, uh, the overcrowded homes. It's a, this is a very um, predominant phenomenon in Romania, like 48% of the total population of Romania lives in overcrowded homes. Um, yeah, then what, what, what else? Um, what I should mention here? Yeah, the, the, the phenomenon of uneven um, housing development within the city, which is uh, also related to, um, so it's, it's related both to the, to the market logic and the logic of the capital, so the capital goes where uh, it, it, it expects for a uh, quick and, and big, bigger profit, but it's also the part of, of politics of the state, so the state interventions which in this case also means like you know investing into some areas, in, including public uh, money for uh, improving it uh, infrastructurally, and these investing in other areas, uh, which uh, you know, yeah, uneven development as part of, of this uh, logic of capitalist development in the in the urban areas. Okay, so. Um, 
Yeah, unequal access to political decision making about the city. This is again a, a process that we have to, to consider. So who has um, instruments, formal or informal, to you know to to make their voice heard when city planning is going on and can influence uh, the urban development plans and uh, urbanistic development plans and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, if we put uh, this into even larger into a larger context uh, of 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 Romania from, uh, and, and to, to address the political economy of housing. Yeah, we need to, to say, first of all, that uh, housing had a crucial role to play in this big transformation from state socialism to neoliberal capitalism. So the, the housing regime change actually was uh, part of this big transformation. So, um, first of all, the, the, I don't know, the privatization of the old state-owned housing stock was a process by which um, this transformation happened and uh, which uh, was needed in order to, to create a market economy, the housing and the residential market in, in this case in, in, in particular. Um, so it's not only that what happened in uh, starting with the 1990s, but also um, <coughs> since the late 1990s, the, the, the Romanian state didn't invest uh, almost at all into the production of uh, social housing. There were some governmental programs which used public budget for uh, um, for a type of housing, but uh, that wasn't social housing in the sense of the housing law because the tenants who um, had, had uh, access to them could buy those homes in a year or two. Uh, while the so social housing in our housing law is still defined as a type of housing which cannot be sold, so it should remain, but yet yeah, it's um, Due to this, uh, these processes of privatization and uh, the predominance of private production of private housing <coughs> in Romania, the percentage of uh, uh, public housing decreased from 30%, which was a nationwide percentage before 1990, but it was higher in, in the cities where the state built uh, more blocks of flats for workers and so on and so forth. So it decreased uh, below 2%. So it's, it's really a big, big change. Mm -hmm. So due to these changes nowadays, uh, basically uh, uh, housing is a super commodity and it's, it's it actually it's accessible only to the market and uh, uh, those who have control on the market prices actually do have control on on, uh, on how are things happening in, in this domain. And besides commodification, um, it's, uh, we, we also um, yeah, know um, a, a, a particular manifestation of housing financialization, which, yeah, again, it's a, a general phenomenon across financialized capitalism. Um, and, and yeah, the countries just differ, I guess, in, in terms of which phase of financialism are we in. Um, so in um, what we do have in Romania is that um, it's, uh, the uh, housing started to become more and more an object of investment and financial asset. Uh, and this is how it's... Uh, actually also ideologically, not only materially and financially, but also ideologically uh, sold. Um, so th if you have money uh, to invest into housing, then you, you must be a, um, a good citizen who knows what to do and a financially educated person, you know, who, who figured out uh, how you can survive nowadays um, in capitalism. 
Uh, okay, then the, the real estate development as a phenomenon also started a little bit later, uh, around 2000, uh, uh, the fir first wave, then the financial crisis uh, a little bit stopped that, uh, um, that trend, but after the crisis, uh, especially well in, in the big in the big cities which is obviously firstly the, the capital city of Romania but also the so-called regional cities like Cluj which are considered like so-called magnet cities or this is the World Bank's uh, term how they define these cities which are supposed to attract investors population uh, culture, sports, so everything like a, a brand for, for a good city. So um, these are, uh, yeah, the, the real estate development uh, uh, strengthened a lot um, in, the, in the past uh, five years and, and uh, uh, prices uh, went up very quickly, uh, even during pandemic. So um, for uh, yeah, some people expected that during pandemic, uh, uh, this, this increase in prices will, will not increase anymore at least, but it, it, this uh, did not happen. Um, and um, economists explain this by the fact that people might have had liquidities because they don't even, you know, make use of uh, uh, of mortgages or bank loans. Um, they are. Um, yeah, many people who, who made money out of um, businesses related to pandemic, for example, but still there are people who are working abroad. There are like four million people, Romanians working abroad, you know, and who um, invest their savings into into housing uh, and in, they invest it in, in big cities because that's something which everybody knows that it's like uh, El Dorado and Cluj is, is uh, the um, second uh, more most expensive city in Romania after Bucharest. Uh, okay, state-led urban regeneration is also part of this larger political economy of, of housing. Uh, there are also EU-funded projects uh, which um, uh, which target uh, uh, now not only the central areas of the cities but also um, former peripheries which are becoming centers. So they are value increases by some infrastructural developments, improving the the condition of, of, of the streets or making a park or. Uh, or, or whatever in investments or parking a lot or something. So um, this state-led <coughs> urban regeneration also uh, changes uh, radically the, um, the not, not, not only the um, buildings, the physical infrastructure of these areas, but also uh, as we know from other parts of the world, it, it also results in the change of, of the population of, of those areas. Many people are uh, owners of uh, blocks of flats, but also family houses. Um, so they are also part of these changes because they are selling their homes. There is a big pressure from real estate developers, you know, to, uh, to, to be small owners, to um, uh, to, to, to sell their, their houses. Okay. Um, institutional racism in the labor housing nexus. I call this uh, phenomenon which, uh, uh, which is actually yeah, about how, um, as we saw in the, in the case of, of, of Patarut, uh, how underpaid, stigmatized, uh, by cases, uh, informal uh, labor is enforced to look for a living in deprived housing areas. Because actually those, those are cheap, and those cheap housing areas uh, actually yeah, are the only uh, uh, possibility for the low, po low, low paid uh, laborers to, 
uh, to make a, a living in a city where they work otherwise. But as you also heard in the in, in, our, in our video, in our performance, uh, yeah, people, uh, so many people are uh, employed, uh, uh, many of them in the sanitation companies, but many also in constructions and services, but uh, yeah, earning the minimum wage, which is like, um, I don't know, 250 euro per month, and uh, a, a rent of, uh, um, two apartments, um, two, 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 sorry, two rooms apartment, it's around 400 uh, euros. So they basically, it's, it's obvious that they don't have access to, to private renting and they don't have access to mortgages because banks do select uh, um, and do have three drawers at least since the uh, 2008 financial uh, uh, crisis. Okay, so yeah, uh, some these are yeah some some concepts that I tried to use in the analysis of, of housing from a political economy perspective. Uh, so addressing housing as a capitalist social social relation. Uh, this is what I'm trying to do as as a, a housing as a as a space for as a space of consumption and, and social reproduction is actually the territory where the labor force is reproduced. This is one part of the of the issue. Uh, but, but the other part is that we can see housing also as a, uh, a site of production, construction, where um, usual exploitation of labor force of construction workers uh, goes on. Uh, in addition to that, what we also have as, as part of this uh, 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 capitalist uh, uh, field is that uh, housing is transactioned as investment. Right? So um, it's, uh, and, and this is part of, of the financialization process together with the mortgage systems and the credit related financial schemes that produce profit for financial institutions. Uh, okay, so that's one way to address housing as part of political economy. Another way to do it is, which, which I also try to do in my writings, in my analysis, is, is following Harvey's um, points about how capital switches from uh, uh, a domain to others, uh, uh, when there is a crisis of profitability, so the, the, the switch to what Harvey calls, and, and also others, the secondary circuit of, of capital, which is actually the built environment altogether, and infrastructure, and uh, housing, and, and other types of buildings. <laughs> so uh, this is what, what we also see that, that, that to invest, that for example, yeah, uh, the, the the profit of many, even local, national, but also uh, foreign capital, uh, the investment of their profit gained from other economic domains into into housing and into built environment, um, because uh, yeah, that's much more promising, right? Uh, nowadays. Uh, and also the, the financial circuit of capital, right, which is in itself a, um, a complicated uh, uh, issue, how, how the credits and different products, uh, securitization of credits uh, um, are, uh, are, are actually showing that uh, housing is uh, far from being any longer uh, uh, a human right or uh, the social value of housing is already forgotten uh, and, and these, these uh, characteristics of it, of being a financial asset actually dominates uh, uh, ideologically and materially the, 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 this regime. Um, Okay, then, um, yeah, we can also speak about how um, uh, 
the, the class position and the housing position of people uh, are uh, influencing each other. And I, uh, mm, yeah, there are interesting analyses about, um, and this is challenging, yes, how uh, within the labor uh, classes, the, the, the housing tenure actually uh, creates uh, um, beating the labor classes um, tensions and, and competition so it, it's very hard from the point of view for example of, of housing activism to build large solidarities around, around uh, uh, the, the, the phenomenon of, of housing crisis right because those who who own an apartment even if it's that small or old or uh, overcrowded, they still have this um, asset that uh, uh, makes a difference in relation to those who, who are private renters and who are unsecured and most importantly makes a big difference uh, from those who, like people from Patarud, uh, do make a living in such uh, uh, deprived and unsecure uh, uh, conditions. Um, so, and, and this is again something that we encounter in our activism and also because yeah, people um, interiorize very much uh, these political messages uh, coming both from the market and the state that uh, if you are good enough and if you work enough then you have money to uh, you know, to to be able to live in a city which is expensive, but if you don't like it or you are not good enough, then you shouldn't want to live in the city. So, like, you know, the the, the total neglect of the um, labor of, of people who, whose work doesn't earn so much to to be enough for for paying for the cost of housing is is totally subverted and um, yeah, all kinds of uh, uh, also racist arguments uh, that uh, people may, may heard and because in, a, in our movement uh, we are together Roma, Romanians, Hungarians and we <coughs> somehow we are identified with activism around Pantarut um, so many people from, from the city who would need uh, social housing and, and who would be, say, uh, uh, would, would have problems, you know, for, for paying uh, their, their, their housing costs, wouldn't join the movement because, uh, well, there are Roma there and if you join the movement means that you yeah, become similar to, to those people who are inferiorized and, and racialized. And, uh, yeah, it's it's hard for many, you know, to to assume the, the stigma, uh, not only for going out, for asking your housing rights, asking for a social housing, which is a stigma in itself, uh, but also being together with with Roma. So it's it's a it's a difficult uh, political construction that um, we are trying to um, to uh, despite of all these difficulties, we are trying to follow in our act. Okay, so yeah, what I uh, also prepared here, but it's really um, would take uh, more, more, more time. It's uh, zooming out even more um, and addressing Romania as uh, as Eastern periphery, Southern periphery of global capitalism and what kinds of roles um, um, did the country. Uh, kind of get in the in the um, this tra big transformational process starting in the 1990s. Um, so um, I don't know. Uh, maybe yeah. And I collected here all kinds of, of data also. So how how um, things which happened in Romania connected to larger uh, processes in in Europe and in in the global stage, um, so uh, how developmentalism in, in, uh, during state socialism um, actually recreated 
what is called in the literature dependent development of the country. So it's um, in the uh, 1970s the, the, the country uh, took a uh, uh, lot of loans from, from the International Monetary Fund, for example, but also from commercial banks, you know, in order to support the development of uh, industries, of, uh, of cities and so on and so forth. And in the 1980s, this um, actually, in a, in a particular political context, um, this um, turned out to be used somehow or against the population. So severe austerity measures were imposed in the 1980s because the, the Biden government decided to pay back all these loans. So, yeah, so, and, and people obviously waited for this to end. <laughs> Uh, and waited uh, or, or made hopes with, in some sort of um, regime changes, maybe. Uh, but what happened after 1990 actually, uh, well, became a, not a dream but a nightmare for, 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 for many people from Romania who lost their, their jobs because uh, the privatization of, uh, of former uh, uh, socialist economic units. Uh, um, Sooner or later, each privatized uh, um, unit uh, was bankrupted, people got fired and became jobless. So therefore, we have this big uh, number of, um, uh, of Romanians who are working even today abroad, right? So uh, the, 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 the uh, intense um, immigration process started uh, in 1990 and it then intensified after the accession of Romania to the European Union, having more rights you know, for, 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 for free movement. Okay, how they were received, that's another story uh, to, to say, but uh, this, is, this is how it happened. So, in a way, Romania provided cheap labor force uh, for uh, uh, Western European countries uh, which needed this labor force, but also in, in the country, right? So, um, the, the, the country became obviously very much uh, uh, dependent on foreign capital, foreign investments, uh, um, and, and, and those companies that came, uh, multinationals uh, or whatever, uh, actually found very cheap labor force in Romania and, and still and it was so this is not a surprise and it was it's it's uh, it's something that was said that the com so-called competitive advantage of Romania is that it has a cheap labor force so this is what attracted the investors um, then uh, yeah and also being a market for the products uh, uh, from from abroad so uh, um, also, yeah, uh, changed the, the, the role of, of Romania after 1990. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, what is um, uh, but similar things might have happened in Portugal as well, but in different periods of time, according to the accession of the European Union, maybe. So you know, this politics of conditionality. Of, of the exception, the politics of conditionality of the loans that still continue to come from the International Monetary Fund and from the World Bank uh, uh, made, um, yeah, but, but the most important condition was privatized. Privatization, um, creating a functional uh, uh, market economy, uh, that, that was were the priorities. And, and besides, we also were subjected to civilizational discourses, you know, democratization, human rights, uh, but they kind of, yeah, were like promises for uh, for people who were uh, deprived um, of, of um, civic political rights before 1990. But actually, if, if we look around today, um, well, the, all the talk about human rights, especially about social and economic rights, is uh, um, um, yeah, it, it's um, hmm, stigmatized in a way or associated with uh, 
this communism, you know, and, and, and in, in Romania, even after 30 years of capitalist transformations, we have a strong anti-communist uh, uh, trend, uh, uh, ideology, um, which, uh, you know, makes again difficult our activism, which is for housing as a social economic right, and uh, it's, it's also, yeah, we, we, become, we are becoming more and more critical and explicit about criticizing capitalism. So we are very easily, you know, put into this category of being nostalgic of Ceausescu's Romania, so being nostalgic of uh, authoritarian communism. So, yeah, so it, you, you know what I mean, that how, how this, this is used as a tool against any initiative that would like to, to change something in, in, in this domain. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah. To 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 work, just to to end with the hmm, yeah with this um, the, the the issue or, or question of what kind of role uh, um, does Romania and and generally maybe Eastern Europe uh, uh, play in. In this new war in Ukraine, which seems to, uh, I mean, everybody expects or says that it's going to be a very long war, and uh, it's it's also and it's about you know how uh, uh, the globalized world as we knew it uh, a few, I don't say months, but <laughs> years ago, but because yeah things started to change even before the war, but now they became more visible, right? So, so the, 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 how the big imperialist power uh, of nowadays are actually um, using Ukraine and, and the population of Ukraine to, uh, to, uh, to, to create a, a new world order according to, to their interests. And in a way, yeah, we can hear also in discourses how the East Europeans became important in this sense, you know, to, to be there to protect values of <coughs> Europe and of the Western world, like, like freedom and uh, uh, democracy, right? So it's uh, somehow the, the yeah, the, the population from, from Eastern Europe is, is changed into this uh, subject to, to defend uh, to defend to defend the West <laughs> in, in a way in the front of a, of, a, of an enemy which is also capitalist but yeah we have good capitalists and bad capitalists it's obvious now and uh, Eastern Europeans former socialist countries need to defend the good capitalism from the bad capitalism. Yeah, so thank you. Um, I